peace, peace family. So hopefully everyone is doing well, ready for the call tonight. And um, before before I give you the update on who the host will be, um, just want to introduce them as usual so you can get your questions ready and um, and just be prepared. So we got uh, King Tosin on the line with us, which is always so exciting because he climbed his way up as a student and um, worked his way to VP of Business Development, I believe, and also he was a key, which a lot of people may not know this, but he was key and very instrumental in the Tulsa Real Estate Fund and bringing that to King J. Morrison. And um, and so it's if you haven't been following, I, I don't know how you missed it, but it's been an epic week last week, and King Tosin had a huge hand in that process, and he's also um, one of the fund managers, I believe. So we, we're really in for a treat when we have King Tosin on the line. So anything real estate related, hit him up because, again, he's an expert even uh, uh, the consultant for Jay Morrison in that, um, you know, he utilizes him in, in, in multiple executive positions. So, King Tosin, are you on the line with us? Yes, yes. Yes, I am. Uh, loud, okay. loud and clear. All right, peace, King. Is there um, anything you wanted to share with us, or would you like to hop into Q&A? Um, at the moment, just to give a little update on the Tulsa Fund, it's been how many days? Five days now. Uh, we've raised $9.6 million in the last five days. So, um, yeah, it's it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing just to see everybody come together and to see us all working together finally to rebuild this Black Wall Street. And we're, and we're getting off to a great start, you know, just a great start. So I just want to thank all of you guys. If there's anybody on the call right now that invested in the fund, hey, you know, we appreciate you, and we're we're going to do this together. Yeah, nice. Say that one more time. How much was it, King? Five days? How much? Nine, one more time. Five days, $9.6 million. Like, what? Revolutionary. Yep. Epic. And you're on the line Definitely. with one of the, the, the ones who brought this to King J. Morrison. This is how we do it in the JMA Academy. You're not speaking to just a volunteer. You're speaking to the, the head of the organization and, like, the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. This is epic. So, without, let me let me just, I try to comment. <laughs> so, so press um, star six if you want to hop in the queue to ask uh, King Tosin a question, and please keep it to two because uh, we expect the, the phone lines to be live tonight as it usually is. So, again, um, uh, press star six if you're a new student. And King, should I should I go ahead and let it go? Most definitely. Let's get started. Okay. All righty. So, call a nine one nine. Your lines are needed. Again, call on 919. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, good evening, um, King. Um, um, yes, my name is um, Raymond from North Carolina, and uh, I've just been in it. I just joined the um, Mastery um, class um, within a couple weeks now, and I was up to um, what Jay was talking about branding. Um, I, I live, like I said, I live in North Carolina, but in March, uh, uh, next year I'm moving to Connecticut because that's where I'm from, so I'm going back home. Do do I set up my uh, my business here as the LLC here, or or I set it up as in Connecticut this year? Or wait till I get there next year. Well, I mean, it, it could it could be either or. I mean, if yeah. you uh, just plan to maintain that LLC, make sure that you're paying your annual filing fees to the state of North Carolina, and, you know, there, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, the only problem that you may run into is that if your business bank account is with a bank that is not in Connecticut, so that might okay. be an issue. So if, if okay. that's the case, then I would say, yeah, when you get to Connecticut, just start a new LLC okay. uh, and open up a new bank account there. But, I mean, me me, me personally, I live in Georgia. My yeah. Both of my LLCs and my C corporation are – headquartered in New Jersey where I was living at and I just moved from there about 10 months ago. And so I'm still u using that, you know, so. Okay. So I can, can kind of go, so I, I go I, ahead I, and set it up now. Yeah. Cause I got, like I said, I got another 10, 11 months before I go. So I can go ahead and get, um, set it up, set it up here in North Carolina. Yeah, sure. I mean, do, do you know what address you're going to be living at when you go back to Connecticut though? Uh, yes. 
Okay, and then if that's the case, then just set it up in Connecticut. You can just do it online and set it up in Connecticut at that address, so that way it'll just be waiting for you. Four four three, you you're live whenever you're ready. Four four three, Merlin, what's going on? All right. So I don't know if you have your phone on mute, but we're gonna go ahead and go to the next caller. I'll look out for you. Make sure you hop back in the queue because we can't hear. Hello. You. Oh, okay. Just made Sorry. it, King. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. How y'all doing, uh, King Queen? Uh, King Tolson. Yeah, right. with him, buddy. Doing, but I'm Ronnie, man. I'm Ronnie good. from uh, – thanks, man. I'm Ronnie from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, you know, I've been going through the academy for like the last two months now. I've uh, been really rocking and rolling, really excited. I actually got a uh, partnership with a mortgage company. Um, my question is I have an opportunity, or should I say a, a short sale opportunity, which would be my first investment, and that's my question. Like, you know, would you recommend me – uh, you know, go with a short sale on a property that needs minimum work, and then like, if so, would I still be using like the sixty-five, you know, uh, a, um, LTV or ARV ratio? So I, mean, I I can't answer that question until I know what you want to do with the property. Like, what are you trying to do with this property? Is it going to be a fix and flip? Is it going to be a rental property? Like, what what is your strategy with the property? Fix and flip, uh, definitely fix and flip. Okay, so if it, if it's a, fi- a fix and flip, what you're going to want to do is you're still going to want to use that 65% ratio. So you're going to need a contractor to come with you to the property so you can get ac- an accurate quote of what it's going to cost to fix it up. Uh, you're going to want a realtor to run comps on that property for you so you know what that ARV value is going to be. And then you'll make your offer to the bank at 65% of that market value. Um, most likely, the bank is going to counter, so you may not get it at 65%. So that's going to be a situation where depending on that market, you know, depending on how confident or, you know, you feel about that market or how confident your realtor feels about that market that's going to help you resell it, maybe you may be able to go up higher to 70% or maybe 72%. But just know that the higher in the percentage that you go, then the more of a risk that you're taking on. But I can almost guarantee you whatever offer you give the bank, they're going to counter because that's just what they do. You know, so you j- j- just keep that in mind as you're going along that process. Cool. Thanks, King. Not a problem, King. Next caller, next caller. Uh, hello. I don't know on today. What's going on, King? Hello, uh, good evening, King. Um, uh, so my question for you today was, uh, as a college student, how could I utilize the fact that I am a college student? I go to school in uh, Hampton, Virginia, so it's not too far from Maryland. A lot of the students that go there, they come from families that move them off campus pretty much after they get out of their freshman year. So how could I u- utilize that to, like, um, to I guess, Further my business. I'm new to the uh, program as well, to the academy. This is only my second. You week, said so. How do you utilize what now? The fact that I'm a college student and I I'm, I have access to people that move off camp, move into apartments and into rental properties very often um, at my at my school. So how can I utilize those relationships to kind of get business? Okay, so you say that you know people who have moved into rental properties. Or, yes, that have moved into rental properties, so I know people that in the future will be wanting to move into rental properties as well. So it's it's just because somebody moves into a rental property, that, that doesn't mean they can teach you anything. Or if they're the tenant, and no, that doesn't make them like no, the real estate investor. No, that's not what I mean. Could I, uh, I, can I reset my question? Go Okay, go ahead and just ask me your question again, but just try to be as clear as possible so that way I can un- okay. understand. All right, and so what I mean is, okay, that. so I'm a college student. So being that I go to school with other college students that also move into rental properties, their parents move them into rental properties. So that would be a lot of business for me because I would have access to people that would be wanting to move into rental properties. So how could I utilize that? Being that I'm a college student, I don't necessarily have um, the – I don't really have the qualifications to get financing at the moment. So should I use, like, a partnership with another investor to try to get that business in as those people are moving into 
are wanting to move into uh, rental properties? Okay, so this is what what you want want to do, um, and you know I, I I say this from a from a place of love and a place of wanting you to build and being that I was once a college student that was trying to get into the business. You should not be trying to buy anything right now because I don't think your understanding of like how that works is too solid. So what you should do is right now you should be focusing on finding a full time job that you're going to keep for the next two years so that you can get that income history. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you file your taxes for the next two years, so that way two years from now you can qualify for a mortgage to purchase a multifamily, and then we can now have that conversation of how you're going to utilize these friends that you have that could potentially be your tenants. But the most important thing for you to do right now, you don't want to jump into the deep end when you don't know how to swim. That's that's suicide. So what you want to do right now is you want to focus on getting quality training and education on owning multifamily property and then simultaneously building that job history and that income tax history that the bank is going to ask ask of you two years from now in order to grant you that mortgage that you can use to purchase your first investment property. And, and, and I, like, I just, just to make a time, like, I appreciate that type of feedback, too, that you just gave to King because a lot of times what organizations do is like, oh, yeah, yeah, come on board. Go ahead and get that property, and then we'll help you take care of that. Or, or just pay us, and we'll be your consultant. To, you know, yeah. so and really, what you're doing is like you know the the whole concept of teaching a fish, and that's how we build as a community when we when we really learn and understand and have a strong foundation. And it may not be yeah, necessarily and, what we want to hear, but it's important. Yep. And and, and in all honesty, like I I want you to succeed. You know, and, you know, when I was 20 years old, I was, uh, I started college, my first year of college, I was 20. I started about a year and a half late. And one of the biggest mistakes that I did my freshman year of college was trying to start and run multiple businesses when I knew nothing about business. I had no teacher. I had no coach. I read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, and all of a sudden I thought I was, the, you know, the Donald Trump or the Don Peebles of the world, and I'm, and I'm hopping out there <laughs> trying to do everything and not knowing or understanding anything about the business. And so, you know, you are young enough that you can spend the next two years getting really, truly educated, and when you decide to actually start in the game, you'll still be young as hell. Like, you'll still be young. So it's, it's not like you really are losing time. You know, you're not falling behind. You know, it, it would just be a better strategy for you to just really, really, really get your knowledge up before you hop in there. Awesome. So call a 936. Your line should be unmuted. Again, call her Hi, how you guys doing? Hi, King. Hi, Queen. Hey, how you doing, Queen? Um, my name is Derica from Dallas, Texas. So my question is more based on buying um, from tax sales, foreclosures. I have a rental property already following the system that you guys have been teaching with the academy. And um, I just want to know, um, well, I plan to use easy funding to get my next property and buy it at a tax sale. And I've been researching them, but can you just give me any insight for things that I may have missed about buying foreclosures from like a county? One hundred percent, one hundred percent. So if you're going to go to a tax sale or a tax auction, and you're going to use your easy funding, this is something you have to keep in mind, right? Once you okay. use that easy funding, you're going to have that bill coming in to pay that back every month. But at most tax sales, even when you buy the property you don't actually get to take hold of the property until, until a year later. So you have okay. to keep in mind that you would have spent the money and been paying on the money but not have total control over the property for an entire year because they still give the original owner a year to redeem those past taxes. So if you okay. are going to buy a tax sale, you don't want to use loaned money at a tax auction or a tax sale. Because that interest is going to be piling up, and you're going to have no money, no no income coming in from that particular property. So if you have right. other properties, if you have other rental properties that are bringing you income, or you have another source of income that you can use to offset during that time that you're waiting, then great, mm -hmm. great. But if you if you're relying solely on easy funding, I wouldn't use your easy funding money to buy a, a tax sale uh, property. I would just go after something that you can buy free and clear. Uh, okay. Direct to owner, 
or, you know, something that, you know, it's it's going to be a 30-day closing period, you know, something like that would be okay. a lot safer, be a lot safer of, of a, 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 a move. Okay. Well, this is the second part of that question. It was a foreclosure from a, from um, the county um, sale. So it wasn't necessarily gotcha. I, I that wrong. It wasn't a tax sale. It was a foreclosure from there. So um, okay. I was just, is, is that a safe buy? Because I know people who have done it who have been in the um, academy with me, and they've done really well with them. So I was just kind of skeptical. Sure. So skeptical. Are, yeah. yeah, would, would they be buying the same way that, that you're buying, though? Because you're going to be using credit. So would they right. buying using credit or would they buying using cash? Because even at the tax they, foreclosures, for, foreclosures in general um, take longer to close than regular sales. A regular sale can close in 10 days. There, there is right. no foreclosure on the face of the planet that's closing in 10 days or 14 days. So you would want right. to find out. <laughs> you would want to find out from either the bank that foreclosed or the town, the county. Like, what is the closing period like? Like, when will I actually be able to take possession of this property after I pay you? You know, okay. and if it's like, you know, if it's a two month period, okay, you know, that could that yeah. that could work. You know, but yeah, if that's it's anything longer than that Yeah. But if it's anything longer than that, it yeah, it kinda scares me as as far as a risk. It it wouldn't be a risk that that, that I would take. Okay. Thank you all so much. I appreciate everything y'all do. Uh not a problem, Queen. We appreciate you as well. And congratulations on that apartment building. She slid that in there like, so that's good. Good to hear what people win, especially the queen. Definitely. And king. Thank you. Definitely. Am I on? You are. Yes, you are. Six, you're live. I am on? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes. This I can hear you loud and clear. On. Am I on, Tossin? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. I think I know who this okay, is. Okay, all right. Okay, king. It's Mary Jane, queen. Yep. How are you doing, Queen I, Mary? What an honor to be speaking to you. My question is, I'm about to do my LLC and my EIN. After I do that, um, I have bad credit, so that will be an improvement from 609. How much will I jump up? Um, so it actually just depends what is wrong on your credit. So if you're already oh, on okay. the 6th. Okay, identity uh, theft. If, if, I have identity theft. They put fraud gotcha. alert. Now, un- un- I own understood. my property. Of ni- I paid 95000 and included the furniture because I was a domestic violence victim. Anyway, what I now want to ask you, I have the deed. I, uh, once I get my LLC and my EIN, I want to start my own business. This is what I want to do, my desire. I am a legacy 911 dispatcher. I want to take the youth that's going to be incarcerated because they're headed in the wrong direction and I want to give them direction and I want to train them in real estate and also mentoring if they want to be dispatchers. I am a professional police dispatcher. I only have a high school diploma. I started at the age of 21 and I am now going to be 70. I Okay, Queen. So just one, one quick... Oh. Um, so, so what? I think the first question. Let's just just so we can make sure we get to all the students on the line. Yes. Um, which well, What's your question for tonight? My, so I think her question my, was. Go ahead. Go ahead. My question right now, then, because I've already said about the the issue with my credit, and I'm going to prove it that it's all due to fraud. I want to take the money, and um, take out the full. What is it? Eighty percent? Is that correct? that the bank should give me since I have a hold the deed? All right. Correct. Okay, King. So with the with the credit issue and then so how can she go about doing that? Yeah, so if the credit issue is just as simple as um us pulling a credit report from credit check total, we'll be able to see everything that's on her credit report that is hurting her credit and then we would just have the the credit team dispute those things. So she's at a 609, then it, 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 she's not far away from a set 700. We could probably get her to a 700 in like a month and a half or two months or so. Um, as far as her, excuse me, as far as her pulling out, you know, the 80% equity um, on her house, I don't think that would be the best idea. 
um, what I would do first is hold on to that asset. If you hold that asset free and clear, you have the deed, there's no mortgage on it, you don't want to liquidate that. You don't want to put you know, debt on that and now start gambling and risking with that. Let's fix your credit. Let's get you into an easy funding program, and we'll leverage your credit alone. So that way you keep that asset in your name. Investing is a risk. So sometimes things can go bad. So if something does go bad, at least you still have this asset that you own free and clear to anchor you down. And so it's all about strategy. It's not about using every tool you have in the toolbox just because you have the tools. It's about knowing how to use the tools. And so in her case, I would say, Mary, do not get a home equity line of credit on your house. Do not put a loan on it. Do not put a lien on it. None of that. Leave that alone. What we'll do is focus on fixing your credit getting you some easy funding, and then we can have a conversation of how we're going to leverage your credit and use your easy funding to get into another investment. Hey, King, how are you doing? I'm doing well, King. How are you? Hey, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Hey, yes. I'm um, Voice Brown King. I'm from Delaware. I would like to ask you guys today, um, I'm working at a retirement home in Wilmington, Delaware. So what's a good way to find leads? In a retirement home or are you just asking in general? No, nah, like I work in a retirement home every day. So that's where I'm spending my whole day at 11 to 7. And I know it's like a bunch of people like selling homes there or, you know, stuff like that. So I'm wondering like what, um, what's like a good you. way to do it. So, yeah. So it's tricky because if you're if you're if you're if you're asking me, should you be talking to the people in the retirement home to find out what houses they're trying to sell? It's very tricky because at the end of the day, a retirement home, you know, you're supposed to be focused on taking care of those individuals as they're in the old age. Yeah. So you yeah, so you don't want to sound like a predator or a shark who just wants yeah, to that's find out who's, about, yeah, that's who's about to die, who's about to die, who wants to sell some property. So what you can do is. You can, you know, create uh, very honest and uh, and genuine relationships with those people, and let let them know you are in are an investor. That hey, if they have anyone in their family who uh they who you can talk to, then to send them your way. But you don't talk to them about it because that just seems very. It seems very predatory to me. It just doesn't sit right with me. You know, it's like if I, I'd rather talk to their son or their daughter or somebody who is, you know, totally of complete sound mind, and then I, I'll speak to that person. But I, I, I would not jeopardize your integrity of trying to get leads by, you know, talking to these older people and trying to find out, you know, what they got. You know, that's just that's just not good business. Yeah, that's that's why I asked it. Thank you. Not a problem, King. And caller um four four three seven six two. It looks like we lost you right before the last caller. So if you want to hop back in the queue, um I'll look out for you. Sounds good. So caller six seven eight, your lines are muted. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Hey, uh so I have a primary mortgage currently that I just turned into a rental property. Uh, going on six months now. I have like four months, four more months on the lease for that rental property. Um, what would be my next move? I want I want to get into uh, REI. What would be my next move to get uh, another property? Uh, my credit score is pretty decent, but I have uh, open accounts that I, that I do pay on, and uh, I also keep the the monies that you know the. Uh, the monthly cash flow from that rental property. So what would be my next step? What direction do I need to go in to start my business? Is it uh, do the LLC first and, or, or what? Let what, me ask you a question. You Let me ask you a question. So what you want to do first is um, you want to go to your bank, whoever you have your primary mortgage with, and see if okay. they'll approve you for a second mortgage. So what they're going to do is they're going to look at your DTI, your debt-to-income ratio, and they're just going to see, okay, with this current rental income property that you already have and with, you know, your current job or whatever your your other source of income is, they'll combine that together. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll look at your assets minus your liabilities and see if they can approve you for another mortgage. And if they can, then you can get pre-approved for your second mortgage 
and reach out to a couple of realtors and just tell them, hey, I'm looking for an investment property. So if you want to get into another rental property, tell them to find you three-unit and four-unit property. So it's really that easy. Now, if you can't get approved for a second mortgage, then we got to look at other options as far as uh, financing or purchasing your property could be. So you could use a private lender. You could use a hard money lender. There's, there's so many other options. Um, I'm not sure what your savings are looking like, but typically when you're not going through a traditional bank, you're, you're typically going to have a higher down payment. So, um, right. you know, asset-based lenders are, are basically lenders that they don't really care about your job history or, or your credit score. They care about how much cash you're bringing to the table. So okay. there's quite a, a couple options for you, but I feel that hey, if you're already if you already have an open mortgage, then that means that bank at one point in time thought you were fit enough to give a mortgage, right? So I would go back to them and say, hey, you know, would you guys give me a second one? You know, and so just depending on your relationship with them and your DTI, that would probably be your lowest barrier to entry. Yeah, that, that's my that's my concern at DTI, you know. You got a uh, student loan and you, you got other stuff, you know what I'm saying? Regular life Correct. stuff, open accounts and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, of course. A, a mortgage loan officer told me it would be different for, for a rental property. It would pretty much be a conventional loan if they give me a second mortgage. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, now, let, me, I mean let, me, let me ask you, let me ask you, is the second mortgage, is that a refinance or? No, a second mortgage is if you're getting a totally different mortgage to buy a totally different house, it's totally separate. A refinance is on your existing mortgage to get into a lower interest rate. So that's two separate things. But um, you know, regardless of what what your DTI is, whether you have open loans or, or anything like that, it it would kind of make sense to kind of just uh to uh, to visit that option first. Because, you know, when you are buying multifamily or you, you are buying properties that are going to be rentals, they some lenders do take into consideration um, how much income that property that you're going to be buying is going to be making. Um, some lenders don't. So you may have to go to a lender that's not the original bank that gave you a mortgage. You know, so it's all about just, you know, you're just going to have to get out there and start talking to some, you know, banks, start talking to some money people and finding out, what your what your options are, you know the the only way to play this game is to actually be in the field. You can't do it on the sidelines. You can't do it on Google and the internet. You got to get up out of your bed, hop in your car, go down to five banks, go down to five private lenders. <laughs> you know you got to really get out there and find what what your options are. But I will say that no matter what level you are in your career in your real estate career, there is a strategy for you that can allow you to play the game and win. All you got to do is just find out what you can do. You know, my first property that I got, I didn't have uh, the two years job history. I didn't have the income. I didn't have the tax returns. I had none of that. So I had to find a creative way to buy my first property. And I, and I ended up finding out that I could buy property directly from the city for pennies on the dollar. And that's what I did. I bought my first property from the city of Newark, New Jersey for a thousand bucks. You know, so there, there, there's a million ways that you can get in the game, but you just got to find out, you know, what's the most conducive to where you're at at the moment. Hey, how you doing, King? I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, I can't complain. My name is uh, Ben, and I'm calling out of Jersey. Jersey. And, um, what's going on? Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to um, – I've been in – I've been enrolled for about 30 days now, and um, I've just been reading through the textbook and watching the videos – and I'm leaning more towards like uh, getting into uh, wholesaling. So, um, gotcha. in a textbook, in a textbook, it was talking about how like uh, you know um, building your brand for your business and everything. So, what I wanted to ask you, well, um, when I came across it, it was talking about like you know, um, you know, what sets me apart from the other companies and making up my my tagline, just building my brand. So, it's, it, it mentioned to uh, look at other wholesale companies to get an idea of how to design my website and stuff. So yeah. I've been Googling. I don't know where to find other companies or websites where I gotcha. can, like, gotcha. So yeah. where, in New Jersey, where in New Jersey are you at? I'm in South Jersey. I'm about 30 minutes from Delaware. 30 minutes from Delaware. Okay. So um, this is where it's going to take you um, a little bit of um, legwork, and you're going to have to really just get in the field. 
So I'm, I'm going to need you. Do you have a pen and paper? I, I want you to write this down. I want you to write down every single word I'm about to tell you. Yeah, I got it. Okay. So I'm going to need you to drive to North Jersey to Newark, New Jersey, all right? Yeah. The address you're going to is 972 Broad Street, Newark, New Jersey. All right? You're going to okay. go there on a yeah, you're going to go there on a Monday. Make sure you get there before 7 p.m. It's a real estate meetup that I started 2 years ago where almost every single wholesaler, contractor, investor, hard money lender in the entire state, every Monday, they convene there, and they help each other get deals. They help each other brand their businesses. They help each other set up whatever it is that they're trying to do. All right, and I started this back in 2016. You go there, ask for a gentleman named Ben. He's the one that owns the building. Tell him that Tosin sent you and that you need some help, and he's going to get you straight with everything you need, as well as the other 50 to 60 people that will be in the room every Monday, 7 p.m., and they will be more than glad to uh, link you and help you and, and get you straight. Okay. You, you said his name was what, Ben? Ben, yeah. Just ask for Ben. He, he's the owner of the building. He'll be in a suit, hobnobbing with everybody, big smile, <laughs> receding okay. hairline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you and you said that's Monday before you said seven PM? Wait, yeah, it, it starts at seven PM, seven to nine PM, but but you want to get there as close to seven as possible because it does get packed and so you want to make sure that, that you have at least a place to sit because after about eight o'clock it's standing room only. Okay, got you. I appreciate that. Not a problem, King. And he could drop in a that's oh, of course, that hookup. 100%. Uh, 100%. <laughs> that is that yeah, that's hookup. Good. And 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 then it's like almost like any other JMA student, you just got that hookup too. So if you're in the area, why not meet up with that yeah, thing? of course. You know what I mean? 100%. And make it happen. 100%. Um, I, I always try to tell people a lot, of pe- a lot of you guys are trying to play this game from behind a computer. You can't do it that way. You can't. Like, you have to get out in the street. You have to get out in the field. You have to meet the players that are actually doing deals. You can't be on Google and LoopNet and Trulia and Zillow all day and think you're going to get deals done, you know? So I always try to, you know, encourage people. You got to get out there in the field. People have to see your face. You got to rub elbows and shake hands and kiss babies. And, and that's how you <laughs> that's how you build a brand, you know? Hey, King Tosin, what up, dog? I'm all right. How are you? All right. Hey, before I ask my two questions, can you can you drop that address again? Uh, it's 972 Broad Street, Newark, New Jersey. Every Monday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, we've had it every single Monday without fail for the last two years. Rain, hail, sleet, snow, blizzard, doesn't matter. We showing up there. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so my first question is, um, now I set up my LLC already, so what I wanted to know is what are some good net 30 uh, accounts to, that would, you know, that I can get for, uh, like for a brand new startup? Net 30? So, like, what are you trying to do with that? Because uh, if you're trying credit. to get net – yeah, so, like, this is a huge misconception, okay? Yeah. Um. Net 30 accounts, if you're a new LOC or a new business, they're not going to help you get business loans. They'll help, okay. you get lines of, they'll help you get lines of credit. There's a big difference, right? So okay. a, business loan, a business loan or funding is actual cash or credit that I can use to buy something. A line of okay. credit is just that, okay, I can spend X amount of dollars with this particular company for this product only. So you can get a net 30 account with like Uline or Seton Hall, and they'll give you a line of credit for $1,000, but that $1,000, that line of credit has to be spent on trash bags or ink toner or uh, envelopes or like, you know, stuff that, you know, you can't use as money, you know. So okay. um It'll help you build your credit, but it's not going to make a bank say, okay, yeah, this guy paid, you know, a $2,000 net 30 account. Let's give him a hundred grand so he can go buy an investment property. That's, that's just a fallacy. That's not, that's not how it works. Okay. You know, um, 
So your best bet if you're trying to build business credit that will actually get you cash or funding is that, you know, you're going to want to get with a program, a business credit program, either Easy Funding, which we offer. Um, there's other companies that offer it around the country as well. I'm just saying that we're a lot better than every single one of them. But okay. we will your, – your, your first business funding is going to be a PG, meaning personal guarantee. So it's going to be on okay. your credit, but your LOC file will be on there as well. So your EIN number, your LOC, all that stuff will also be on there. And then depending on how you do with that in the beginning – then, you know, if you can maintain that for a year, two years, then you can gradually get to a point where you apply for loans solely in your EIN number. But I always okay. tell people, yeah, I always tell people, this is not. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I hear Hello? you, King. Okay, oh, okay. King Tosin? If, yeah, for some reason, I think it, like, booted me out for a second. Yeah, but, um, I can't hear you. I think the phone cut off. But, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so I, I was saying that, you know, this is not 2005. Now, you can't just take your EIN number, have no history, and go to a bank and get 200 grand. You know, you have to have some skin in the game if you're going to do business funding. In the beginning, if you're starting from scratch. Now, if you, you know, if you treat it well, you pay your stuff back on time, you make great business decisions, and, you know, you're profitable, then you can eventually kind of um, venture off into doing things solely in your business name, which kind of takes away the liability from your Social Security number, and you can soar and fly that way. But it's going to take you about a year and a half to two years, and, and your first business loan or uh, um, leverage credit is going to be a, on a personal guarantee as well as your business EIN. I got to talk. Good evening, good evening. Hey, how you doing, King? What's going on, Tosin? I'm doing well. How are you? All right, all right. I got the same question from last. Uh, I sent you an email uh, two times to your um, your JMA account, but uh, I know you're a busy man, so uh, hopefully I can get an answer tonight. But I, I still yeah, I mean, that JMA email doesn't work, work, work anymore. I'm on Tosin now. Oh, okay, okay. I didn't get that. Okay, so I I got the same credit question. Uh, I completed the credit mastery course uh, by King Will, King Will, and uh, he recommends using friends and families as authorized users, right? Of course, hundred percent. But you know, when the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, and you know, birds of a feather flock together, looking in your immediate circle might not be the best option, but it might be the next best thing. Um, but, you know, my question is, you know, why trade bad for fair when you could, you know, trade up for, like, excellent? You know what I mean? So my question is, do you have any links or resources used to connect credit builders to AU accounts? Gotcha. So... Um, this is another, and I'm glad you asked that question. This is uh -huh. another reason why, this is another reason why it's very important for you to get out in the field away from your computer and actually yeah. go to these, you know, networking events, these real estate net networking events, build uh -huh. relationships with people. Okay. And when people get, begin to trust you, then you can find what's called a credit partner. Somebody okay. who knows your credit isn't that good but maybe you mm -hmm. understand real estate a bit better than them. What they have to bring to the table is their good credit score. So they can add you as an AU, help you build your credit, and then together you guys can co-sign on a loan or a mortgage and, and kind of, you know, grow that way. So it's very, mm -hmm. very important. Like, you have to get out and meet people. You have to get mm -hmm. out there and network, and that's how you find partners. Partners doesn't always mean that, you know, both your names are on the same LLC or that you put in X amount of dollars and they put in X amount of dollars. Sometimes yeah. a partner can be somebody who has the knowledge but no mm -hmm. credit and no cash. But right. I have the credit and cash but no knowledge, so we can partner mm -hmm. up together. So you have to find somebody who has what you don't have and who mm -hmm. you have what they don't have. And the only way you're going to find that person is to go out on a regular basis and meet person after person after person after person. And so that way you're not relying on your own inner circle of friends and family. I'll, I'll tell you this much. If mm -hmm. I relied on only the people that were in my immediate circle 
when I was uh-huh. growing up in St. Louis, if when I was growing up in St. Louis, Missouri, you would right. never have heard my name, saw my face. I would have never have met Jay. I would have never mm-hmm. have moved to New Jersey. Like you have to get out of your yeah. immediate circle because for for the most mm-hmm. part, your immediate circle, family and friends, as much as we love them, there's not mm-hmm. really that much that they can do for you. Mm-hmm. And so you know, it's not it's not throwing shade at them. We still love them, but your mm-hmm. goal yeah. for your life is to is to grow. It's to grow. Yeah. And, you know, and to, and to grow, yeah. you have to get out there. You have to get out there and do uh, things mm-hmm. that may feel unco- uncomfortable at first. But um, yeah. they do yield rewards. Yeah, and that's why that's why you know I joined JMA, and um, I'm a happy member, a happy uh, student. But I was hoping that we had something like in house where we could like you know connect with um, you know like minded individuals and you know AU accounts to like credit holders and that sort of thing. I mean, so if we if we do everything for you, how you gonna learn how to do it yourself? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You know, the, and so you know, at some time, you know, the bird has to leave the nest. Yeah, I just so, thought you, know, you got to get out, you got to get out there and leave leave the nest, King. You'll be all right. You'll be good. You'll be great. I promise you. And I'm not sure if that's this is the direction we're going in, King. We do have Black Wealth Weekend, you know, coming up. So it's where we, you know, essentially it's a Tulsa real estate uh, ball, and then um, there's also like the JMA Academy Conference. So there and then it's a face platform so we got opportunity to connect um we do have to be intentional about it and um yeah, yeah. Know, show up too so all right so of course, of course. Call. yeah yeah okay and is it it's black wealth weekend and then um it's the tulsa real estate ball right did i get that right King? or did i mix it up uh that is so tulsa real estate ball is august 17th when is black wealth weekend i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure when they okay. schedule that for got you but hey. i'm gonna look it up and then hey, i think King, hey, Queen, how you doing? can you peace, hear me peace, King. doing all right yeah i can hear you loud and clear hey man i got two quick questions so i'm in the easy funding program and my plan is to get the funding uh, get me a property using the 65% ratio. Um, after I do that with the easy funding, how long um, is a good time frame in order for me to go refinance uh, with a bank to take that, you know, to, to refinance, take the money and pay off the, the cards, the credit cards from easy gotcha. funding? Like, is exactly. it like a six so, month? Excellent question. Excellent question. So the, the typical time is six months, but I will try to refinance okay. as soon as possible. As okay. soon as possible. So if you can find a lender that's going to refinance in two to three months, then I would jump on it because your main goal is to refinance into that long-term 30-year 30 lo- 30 loan that you can get for, you know, anywhere from 3.8 to 4.9%. That That's the ideal um, um, situation okay. you want to get into. So, I, yeah, I, I'd be trying to refinance as soon as possible. Cause, and my follow-up to that was I was going to ask, is it better to do um, – a 30-year or a HELOC, and the reason I ask, uh, I'm asked about a HELOC is because the you know a regular mortgage is closed ended. A HELOC is open, and so if I refinance to a HELOC, I can be using the rental payments to actually pay down the HELOC, and then have um, that line of credit available to me, and then use that to purchase another property. Is that do you think I should do that, or should I just stay with the traditional 30 years? So is this a single family property or a multifamily? Yeah, it's it's a it's a single family. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's only because yeah, I have okay. a possibility from like a family member to possibly get this single family. Got you. And so you own this property free and clear, and you're thinking about getting a HELOC on it? Well, I, I will. I mean, using the easy funding, like I said, purchase it, fix it up, put a rent in there, and then refinance. But I don't know if I should do a traditional 30 year. Got you. So or just do a HELOC. You have, got you. So if you haven't done that yet, if you haven't made a mm-hmm. move yet, my advice mm-hmm. to you is don't even you don't even do anything with that single family. Just sell it, sell it, and use that money and buy a multi-family property. I, I want everybody on the call to listen to this really clear. A single-family home is the worst investment you could ever make as a real estate investor. It's terrible for an investment, ter- un- unless you're doing a fix and flip. But if you're having a single-family home for rental purposes, you are making a terrible decision. Because there's too much liability. Imagine, you know, you can only have one tenant in a single-family house. What if that one tenant loses their job, they can't pay you, and it takes you six or seven months to evict them? Six or seven months, you're not getting any payments. You can't pay the mortgage or your monthly HELOC payment, and the bank comes and forecloses on you. Now, if you have a four-unit, 
let's say one or two units, one adult, two two tenants can't pay you because they get fired or lose their job. Okay, no problem. While you're going through the eviction process with them, you still have two other units that are paying you, and that can cover your expenses and ride you through that storm, ride you through that dip until you can now get those other two units with paying tenants. So if you're going to invest for rental property, you really, really, really do not want a single-family home to be the property that you get because you're just exposing yourself to too much liability and risk. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, it's so funny that you just said that because that's along the lines of my question, actually. Yes. Hello? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, Queen. Oh, okay, thank you. So I have, um, I'm new to all of this, and I'm enrolled in the Wealth Mastery course. I have never purchased a home or own any property, um, but I am interested in, like, owning units that have tenants. So my yes. question is, because I live in New York City, and New York City is super expensive. Um, <laughs> um, really Where in New York City so do you live? I live in Queens right now, from Brooklyn. I live okay, in great. So I got a perfect solution to you. Just go, just cross the Hudson and go over to Jersey. You can find <laughs> three live? and four unit property. No, not 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 to live. Oh, I, I'm I like, I every yeah, yeah. You don't have okay. to live there, but I I tell every single New York person that I ever talk to, stop mm -hmm. trying to buy property in in New York because it's just too much of a inflated market. Yeah. So if you're mm -hmm. a big, yeah, if you're a begin if you're a beginning uh -huh. investor. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there, there's condos and co-ops in Manhattan that are like 500 square feet that cost 350 grand. But you right. can take 350 thousand, go mm -hmm. to East Orange, New Jersey, which is literally 25 minutes away, and buy mm -hmm. a four unit, and buy a four unit where each of the units can be rented out for 1250, and you can be making five thousand dollars a month and only have a mortgage payment of 1500 bucks a month. Nice. You know, so I would really look at I would really look at um New Jersey as a, okay. a real solid option for you. Um, okay. If you have a pen and paper, um, if you can yeah, take do. down my email address. Yeah, take down sure. my email address. I'll be able to send you a lot of resources as far as my real estate team that's still in New Jersey. I started my entire career in New Jersey, and I just oh, left wow. 10 minutes. Yeah, I just left 10 months ago. So all of my team is still there. The bar that I own is still there. That's why I sent the other gentleman that's coming from South Jersey to go to that meetup. But um yeah, there there is a lot of opportunities for you. So it's it's okay. Tosin T O S I N. T O S I N. Yes. At Tulsa Real Estate Fund dot com. Tulsa Real Estate Fund dot com. And do you yes. mind telling me the address that you shared with the gentleman for the meetup just because sure. I came in on the latter part of that conversation? Not oh. a problem. It is it is nine seven two Broad Street. Newark, New Jersey. The name of the uh, venue is called La Rouge. It's a it's, it's a lounge and restaurant. And so every Monday, we have a a real estate meetup there, um, without fail every Monday, seven to nine p.m. for for the last two years. And I got so you can it. also just ask for Ben. You can ask for Ben or ask for Keisha, and just tell them Tosin sent you, and they will take care of you. Yeah, King, I just had to, like, I cannot let the moment pass by. So when King Tosin says, reach out to him, please do so. Like, uh, I got, you know, and I don't know, I don't know if it was missing during a call, but got to give shout out to King Tosin. Uh, he, he gave me some information, and the last wholesale deal that I closed was based on the information that he gave. So, you know, this is, like, really what the family's about. When they say, reach out to me, you know, please take advantage of that because, you never know. I mean, that could be your next deal. Like, um, Most I can say that with a hundred percent. Most definitely. So, Most definitely. Uh, yeah, so, uh, caller 412, you're live. Miss Tamara, how are you? <laughs> this is Frank from Pittsburgh. Frank, we did it, King. I yeah, know you, you were on. I know you was on a, on a truck call. You had to be, I know you got to be an honorary founder. You got to. Oh, you already know that. <laughs> I, I got in, I got in June 1st. So that, Look, I, all right. I already know. That's why I asked. Right. Peace, man. Tosin, what's up, brother? Man, you just broke uh, my heart. You just broke my heart with that uh, single family statement, man. I've been eating oh, since '99. Yeah. 99. yeah. I, I feel you. You you just been getting lucky. God's been blessing you. 
I've been eating great. off of single families and duplexes since 99. Man, you broke my heart. I know you know everything there is about the game. I know that part, but, man, I was I mean, I, I, feel, I feel way better about duplexes than single families. Single families, I just feel like you're just waiting for the executioner to come and cut your head off. Nah, nah, nah. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 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 moving on to, the, you know, the four and five units now. So I wanted to get some clarity Perfect. on, some clarity on, when I'm speaking to private lenders and whatever I'm uh, shooting for, let's say, say 20000 and we agree to a 6% uh, five-year payoff, every yeah. year I pay them, let's just say, that 6% every year, or do I pay them that 6% just for that that first year? Or do I pay um, so that it, every it year depends on the off? yeah it depends on the lender because a lot of these lenders they have their own policies as far as like how they're going to make money so some of them it may be principal only some of them it may be interest only some of them it may be interest and a percentage of the principal so like I would have to know what um, lender you're actually trying to go with to figure out what the plan is because if there's one thing in this private lending game. All of these guys, they're not like a Bank of America or a Wells Fargo or Chase where everybody pretty much has the same type of products. These are guys that, you know, they came together, they've got like $40 million, and they say, you know what, let's form an LLC and let's lend out this money at a cost. And so they come up with all types of, you know, creative programs and products and different policies and stuff. So that would be a question you would have to ask the actual lender that you want to use as far as like what they're going to charge you and, you know, how they're going to make you, you know, pay them back. Well, uh, I got you on that, but I'm kind of speaking on, I'm working on personal people that I know. So based off, oh, of, okay. their, so based off of their trust in me and my knowledge, they're willing to oh, lend wonderful. me based off of whatever we agree to. So if I'm getting okay. them more than what they can get anywhere else, they're fine with that. I just want to make sure 100%. that when I'm talking to them, I'm telling them I'm going to pay them back their, their 8% over each year that I have the loan for or just that one year? Yeah, so you can do the interest um, over each year you have the loan for, and then you just give them their, their principal at the end in like a balloon payment. All right. That gotcha. can work. Gotcha. Real quick on my last one. I'm looking to, no set, up a L- I'm looking to sell up, set up an LLC under my daughter's name who's 16 so she can start purchasing property. Would I have to be on that LLC in order for her to go get a loan? Because I never heard the bank ask what's the member's ages that's on the LLC. So can will I have to put um, my name no. on that LLC? So they don't typically ask the name of the ages, but the underwriter, when the underwriter, like, you know, whatever they do to underwrite that deal, they may run the credit or not just depending on how new or old the LLC is. But okay. if they find that out, if they find that out during the underwriting process that, you know, the sole member, the only member is 16 years old, I can see them having an issue with that if they're not paying cash and they're trying to get a loan. Um, it doesn't mean that your daughter's not capable of doing it on her own. I just know these, the, the, these underwriters, they're just going to find some type of reason to deny that. So to save it, what I would say is just put yourself on the LOC, you know, do whatever you have to do to maybe get the loan and – your name and put her on the deed because you can get the mortgage in your name and put her on the deed no matter how young or old she is. And then, you know, sometime down the line, maybe when she turns 18, just remove yourself from everything. And now she is the sole owner, sole member, sole beneficiary, et cetera. So there's some Uh, ways, but I think the easiest way is just for you to kind of just help her out a little bit and kind of, you know, let them use daddy's information for a little bit. <laughs> All right, cool. Got you in the ball is the 17th through the 19th, and God bless y'all. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Good looking out. Good looking out. Like, I, I literally had it up. So, so King Frank just gave you the update for Black Wealth Weekend. If you're not familiar with it, please go to blackwealthweekend.com. Like he said, 17th through the 19th. It's going to be um, like epic, like like because it's not before the first one was like in preparation for, you know the yeah it was, <laughs> right? and yep, now yep, yep. and now we were eight eight million on our way to nine million in. So trust me, no, we, we already passed nine million. <laughs> we're nine point six. Yeah, every time we took ten <laughs> minutes, I refresh the screen. It's like more people. I can't. I can barely keep yeah, up. Yeah, it's okay. going higher. Yeah, yeah. That's nuts. <laughs> And then there's a JMA conference. So, um, so you yes. know, if you can't make it a one, 
I mean, or make it the one, make it the both, do whatever you can. So thanks, uh, King Frank, for giving us that update. And caller 334, your line should be unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Great. So uh, I signed up for easy funding. I paid the fees. And I had an appointed time, but I didn't get a call. So I was just trying to see if there's any other way to contact to just follow up. Yeah, just call the office tomorrow morning at like 10 a.m. if you can, one eight four four join gma Ask for Melinda, and she'll get that all squared away for you immediately. Okay, one second. And it was eight four four five six four six five six two. Yes, correct. Okay, that is the number just, just, I have been just calling. Just make sure you ask for Melinda. Make sure you ask for Melinda. Right, so that's the number I've been calling for like the past week or so, and I can't get anyone on the line. Okay, so if you've been calling in the last week or so, we just got, uh, as as we launched the fund, we got 6,000 new investors that came into the portal, and so everybody's trying to call in. So what you're doing is you're probably just calling in at the end of the queue. That's why I always say call early in the morning. If you call at 12, you call at 1, now you're battling against, you know, two or 3,000 people that are trying to call in to ask about, a, you know, a various uh, laundry list of things. So always call early in the morning as, as soon as possible, and you'll be able to get through, guarantee it. And over 25,000 emails and like plus and counting. So thanks for all those who have patience with us as we build and do what's never been done in history. So it, there may be some delays, but please be patient with us and continue to build. Just like King said, it was like, I don't know how many calls you get in the office. I know I think over three hours, at least it's, when I, uh, it was about 130 calls. Yeah. And I know it's over 25,000 yeah. emails, just to give you all an idea. So we're not just forgetting about you. We just got to, um, you know, save our people, build our community. Yep. It's a little busy, slightly. So call it 206. <laughs> yes. Uh, good evening, King Green. My name is Lena from Seattle, and I am calling uh, to ask King. Uh, I am uh, going to be viewing uh, properties. I'm a veteran, and I'm going to be viewing properties uh next week and i wonder if you have uh any suggestions uh for me as i uh view these properties with the real estate agent and also you know i've been told so many different uh times and different things to do about setting up uh, an llc uh some say set it up before you purchase the property. Others say you should uh, wait until you close on the property and then maybe uh, if you want to quick claim the property into an LLC because uh, the lenders don't look up on uh, you having an LLC when you go to purchase the property. What is your suggestion? So, I mean, as they say, there's a million ways to skin a cat. So everything that you just said could work. Um, It really just depends on what's convenient for you. So a lot of times people will purchase the property in their name, uh, and then when they close, they'll quick claim deed it to an LLC, and they'll name the LLC the address of that property. They usually do that for accounting purposes or tax purposes. Um, They usually do that when they own several properties. But um, if you don't own a lot, a lot of properties, like there's nothing wrong with just being ready and just start an LLC ahead of time and purchase it in that LLC. The same way how you can quit claim deed it out of your name to an LLC, you can quit claim deed it out of your LLC into another entity. So, I mean, I don't really think that should be something that you kind of get too worried about or too worked up about. I would just say that when you do go on these walkthroughs, make sure that you have a a contractor, a handyman, or somebody who knows something about real estate that is there for you. Because the realtor, I don't care how nice they seem or whatever, they just want to sell the property so they can get a commission. So you don't necessarily want a realtor who's showing you properties to be your your guide or be the person that you're expecting to get 
the most genuine information from. Not saying that all realtors are like that. There are a lot of realtors that are very, very transparent, and they won't they won't let you buy a bad property whether they were going to make a eighty thousand dollar commission on it. But you just want to make sure that you have somebody that can kind of be your third eye, and just 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 kind of make sure that they're looking out for your best interest. All right, King. So I see um, we got one minute before ten o'clock. And normally, yep. as usual, the um, lines are lit, so um, yeah. maybe over. We can could, we could take one more. We, 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 we can take one more question. One more. Okay. So caller number, and if we don't get to you, please um, make sure you hold your questions, bring them back next week, or um, if you, you know, call the office maybe at a time frame that King Tosin just mentioned. Um, because we do want to acknowledge you. We wish we can get to everybody every week. But um, caller 904, your line's unmuted. The lucky caller, Hi. take us home. Okay. How you doing, uh, King Tulsa? Uh, my name is Tim. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, I'm in the Credit to Cash program, and I'm also in the Wealth Mastery uh, program as well. And um, I've been taking notes, basically, uh, for the wholesaling uh, yep. part and – Pretty much I have the formula written down here and uh, with the purchase price plus the rehab uh, liens and fees and that equaling your all-in cost. And um, basically before I even get started, like even uh, pursuing any properties, I'm actually interested in um, multifamily properties, but could you like just give me like a basic example of how to evaluate uh a wholesale deal using the formula. Sure, sure, not yeah, sure, not a problem. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have a single family house in Jacksonville, Florida. So hold on, you said you're in Jacksonville, Florida, right? Jacksonville, Florida, yes sir. Okay, great. So we have a single family house in Jacksonville, Florida. All right. The ARV mm -hmm. of this house, meaning the after repair value, when this house is fixed up and pretty and ready to be sold on the market. That mm -hmm. husband and wife who just has a newborn baby, that this mm -hmm. house is worth a hundred thousand dollars. That's the ARV, okay. right? Yeah. So, but when we go through the house, it needs about ten thousand dollars in rehab work. All right. Okay. And let's say closing costs are five thousand dollars. That that brings us to fifteen thousand dollars, and then you want to get an assignment fee of five thousand dollars. So that brings us to that's twenty grand, correct? Yes. Correct. Okay. So. Yes. What is yeah? So what is sixty five minus twenty thousand? Sixty five thousand minus twenty thousand is what? Hello. Hello. Yeah, that's 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 the question I want you to answer. Like what? Oh, I'm sorry. Sixty-five thousand minus twenty. What's sixty-five thousand minus twenty thousand? Oh, um, forty-five thousand. Forty-five thousand minus twenty thousand. Exactly. So we would offer forty-five thousand dollars for that house because we know it's ten thousand dollars for the house, twenty thousand dollars for the rehab work, and then fifteen thousand dollars for the assignment fee. Correct. 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 So that's the 65% ratio. So that's how you calculate it. You want to make sure that your purchase uh, costs, your rehab, all your fees, assignment fees, closing costs, all of that has to total to 65% of what the ARV is. And so I okay. love just using that, that $100,000 because it's an easy round number. It's just perfect for examples. And so that's how you do it. Okay. And – also, my purchase price isn't supposed to equal my all-in cost, right? No, your purchase price is not your all-in cost. Your purchase price is just your purchase price. Your all-in cost is your purchase price plus your re your renovation cost plus any other fees, including your assignment fee. That's what your all-in costs are. So the purchase price is just the, the cost of the house. That doesn't include renovations and fees. All right, King. Since that was the last caller right. for tonight, is yeah, there yeah. um is there any and hopefully folks are jumping on the Tulsa Talk call on Thursdays. I'm hoping that's the case, but 
is there anything that you wanted to share with us for, uh, before we go? Um, no, at the moment, no. I just want to thank everybody for making the call. Everybody who didn't get to ask a question, um, please join us every Wednesday as we have these calls all the time. Um, and we just really look forward to helping you guys just, you know, push your ball a little bit further down the field. Um, I want everybody to know that, you know, the game of real estate is not always a smooth game. Sometimes it's a little rough. So you got to be patient. You got to be dedicated. You got to be determined. And you got to understand that, you know, this might not happen for you in one year, but sometimes it can. So it's really just about just having patience and know, and just making sure that you're committed to this. And if you stay committed, you will be able to see immense success. You know, I've been in real estate for going on uh, about eight years now, eight and a half years now. And the first time that I ever raised $9.6 million in five days was today. <laughs> so, if I, so if I would have gave up two, three years ago, I would have never have seen this day. And so you have to understand that, like, you have to be committed, consistent, and you have to really uh, have a passion and love this. And I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, there is no way that you can put in real work and not see results. It's just, that's just not how the world works. You know, so I just want to leave everybody with that. Good night. God bless. Love you all. And I hope to see you guys at the Tulsa Ball.